Welcome back to the first episode of our 2024 Friday Feature Artist Series, where we delve into the power of creating whilst healing and community. Tonight, we are thrilled to introduce a remarkable artist whose work is not just a visual feast, but a profound narrative of resilience, introspection, and connection with the natural world. Please join me in welcoming Zara Moradian, a mixed media artist whose journey in art is as rich and layered as her creations. Zara's work is a symphony of earth pigments and fibres, a testament to her deep engagement with ancestral materials and her commitment to environmentally conscious practices. Her art transcends traditional boundaries, weaving together the tangible and the emotional, the personal and the universal. Born in Armenia and now residing in Maryland in the USA, Zara's journey has been nothing short of extraordinary. She gained a bachelor's degree in art and education before heading to Italy to pursue her master's degree. But fate had other plans as she honed her skills by fully immersing herself in the world of art, sketching and sculpture in Florence. Recently, her artistic expression became a healing force during a challenging health crisis leading her to create what have been described as emotional landscapes. In what artist Claire Ben describes as powerful pieces that resonate deeply, even without knowing the backstory. Zara's work is a dialogue with her surroundings, often inspired by the landscapes viewed through her window during her treatment, each piece a reflection of her inner world. Her approach is introspective, not seeking answers, but rather illuminating the intricate dance of her thoughts and emotions. Zara states, I am a silent witness to the active dialogue between my emotions, thoughts, and ever-changing nature. Each of these components inform my artistic practice. Expanding her earth pigment work beyond her personal experiences, Zara now casts her insightful gaze towards a wider world with a particular focus on the struggles of immigrants and their frequently overlooked stories. This shift in her artistic direction not only challenges established narratives, but also shines a light on the resilience and tribulations of individuals amid conflict, extending beyond her own immediate surroundings to embrace a more global view. As we venture into the conversation with Zara, we invite you to witness the beauty and depth of her art where each stitch, each pigment, tells a story of healing, discovery, and the profound connection with the world around us. Let's explore the journey, inspirations, and artistic vision of Zara Moradian, a voice that speaks volumes through the subtlety of her work. Hi, Zara. My goodness, hi, thank you so much. That was beautiful, Angela, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. It has been an honour researching more about your work, your history, and of course, we fell in love with you a few months back when you became a student of Out of This Earth with Claire Ben, and we just absolutely fell in love with your work and where it's going. So we had to share it with people, um, the wider audience. So thank you, thanks for being here. Um, I'm, I'm thanking you for inviting me. It's be, it, it's it's an honor to, to be lined up with such an incredible uh, group of artists. Uh, so I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs> oh no, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. Tell us, we're pre-recorded to this interview, so there won't be live questions. But I wanted to uh, reassure the audience: if you do have questions for Zara please pop them in the comments and we'll be getting back to them as soon as we can, as soon as this broadcast. But um, tell us, how did your artistic journey begin? And it's been such an evolution from, I mean, you were classically trained and then you went to Florence and you really studied the sculptures. Just give us an insight into that beautiful history and, and, and sort of where, you, where it led you. I know it's, it's been, it's been a crazy, crazy time. So I started my education in uh, fashion merchandise. However, I was dreaming about being the, the uh, therapist. So it was just really not going together, but I decided to, to go for it. And uh, 
that's when I've been uh, discovering my talent to, to drawing. And I've done a lot of fashion um, influence uh, illustrations. Afterwards, I started my bachelor degree in art. Uh, and um, yeah, a um, classically trained artist who is very much inspired by mechanics of human body, how it works in emotion. And uh, for me, everything else felt boring. You know, it's, it's just, I felt like all the time we can we can always control the facial emotions we can sort of not show anything however the body language never lies so i was intrigued by that subject so i was uh, constantly moving towards um, sculpture or just plainly sitting and uh, sketching um, that will be practiced but my favorite practice would be sitting in a park and uh, just sketching random people who were passing by and coming up with my own stories for them. So uh, yeah, that was, that was that. And then I end up being in Florence planning to go to uh, finish up my master's degree, but the life had a different you know, plans for me. So I uh, got married um, and uh, moved to US. However, I did spend six months living in Italy, which, which was, I can tell, first life-changing experience. Um, yeah. Wherever you go, it's, it's art. Uh, you are influenced by art. You are breathing and living among that beauty. And um, I, would, I would certainly have a huge amount of sketchbooks in my hands and uh, drawing most influential artworks um so i i trained my eyes for the sort of proportion and and the lightness of italian renaissance art yes i loved how you said that you trained your eye to do that and you certainly see that in your work there's a there's a delicateness to it there's a sensitivity to it and and you can see there's been time taken to to study form. These images that we've got here of your human studies in stitch are just beautiful. Can you tell me a little bit about these? Oh, absolutely. Um, those are actually, um, those are influenced by uh, one and only Leonardo da Vinci uh, and his sketches. Uh, once upon a time, I had a chance to go to National Gallery of Art and witness uh, the pure genius in person. I've never seen his, his work before, only the illustrations. So when I uh, took a closer look, it was no any lines, no any boundaries, but you can always see first come, first come the object, then comes the landscape. And it pushes me in so many ways to study his famous fumato. So I started exploring that in stitch and trying to blur the lines and, and work more with the, with the light and shade. Um, one of the works that I've, I think I like 10% succeeded would be that, that, uh, that work, if you can pop that up, uh, the, the, that one, yes. Um, so I've, I've tried to bring more of the, of the, of the light to it. However, keeping some of the story in a shadow. Um, so yes. Mm. Wow. And talk to me about the light and the shadow in terms of the story of this. It's called The View. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you see sometimes, um, uh, yet again, uh, bouncing back to, to uh, Leonardo. Mm. Um, I've noticed one thing in his work. Uh, when it comes to portraiture, um, yes, he was a master of the light and shadow. However, he would, uh, he would highlight and keep the story together, the narrative together, by tidying it up with a landscape. So at first I thought the landscapes and... Uh, in general, that the background was not necessarily important. 
uh, and I felt it was a boring subject. And then when I saw his work, I saw the meticulous way he took the time to draw it. And um, I felt like it is important to draw down the space first, the place, the background, and then put the story in there. Like, this is the place and who belongs in here? What kind of a story do I want to tell in this particular uh, undefined space? So in this work, I was thinking about the view from my window. How would I, what do I feel in those darkest moments? Like, uh, is it just shadow of the, of the, of the hope or is, it's just, you know, passing by shadows of the sorrow or, or, or anxiety. So it was sort of a very emotional work for me. Mm, I was yeah. letting it go by putting it in the shadows, if, if you may. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. I love how you expressed it that way. And just the form, like, of, of the, the figure there with the head down, it looks like the hands could be crossed behind them. They're they're in deep complete com, complete. Sorry, I've lost my word. Contemplation. Um, it's it's just beautiful, and how you've positioned it, like not like they've they've already walked through the frame, and they're walking off into the distance. So they've come a long way on their journey. This is how I feel about it. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's a sort of. Um odd to to those people who felt lost at a times however there is always paths that you can pick you can go towards the light or you can just just you know just just walk out of that situation um yeah. it's always a, a question of choice don't you think <laughs> absolutely yeah absolutely yeah can you tell us a little more about the choice um, of materials in your work, like predominantly with the earth pigments and the fibers, what draws you to these materials? Yeah, so um, in 2018, um, so it was a lot of moving in my life. Uh, first, my, my motherland, Armenia, then to Italy, and then a uh, short period of time in Denver, Colorado, then we permanently moved to Maryland. So it was a lot of sort of breaks within between my art practice. So, um, and I, but I constantly did something on a side as a, as a or commercially on a side. It was always, um, the, the choice was always with the fibers. Um, I've done a lot of commercial boutique um, quite successfully. So when we move here, um, in 2018, I've been diagnosed with cancer, so I had to sort of quit everything and put my well-being on my priority list. So mm -hmm. I've discovered um, the slow art movement for myself, which I've never heard before. And it's yeah. briefly talking, you know what it is, but briefly you just take your time to sink in one artist's work at a time and uh, just not rush and not be, uh, you know, like um, constantly producing. Yeah. The, the toxic productivity, I was trying to fi uh, fight that because when you have that, but you don't have an ability, you need to figure out for yourself how is it that I'm going to be moving forward with it? But I do want to practice art. So it was my ticket to the fiber arts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you you started by joining uh, or learning about stitch and using stitch as a mark-making tool almost. Yes. Tell us yes. about that. Um, so I knew... Um, I knew a couple things from my first degree and then further more when I was discovering a little bit more about batik. Um, I knew stitch or two, but 
there was something missing, you know, like you always know you need to apply a little bit more knowledge to it. So the background helped, uh, but the stitching was, I, I was confused how to proceed, proceed with it. So I've discovered for myself, uh, the, um, in 2020, I, I found out the, um, um, the free stitch, uh, workshops where Susan Stone was uh, suggesting us to explore the limitation in stitching. So take one stitch and then uh, just try to do whatever it's possible with it. Just work with the limitation. And it was a big aha moment for me. Um, after that, I probably got obsessed with the uh, sample making. I was making them constantly. See. Um, when you go to the treatments, yes, and they they apparently they started to become a scrolls because I was making small, 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 and then stitching them all together. Now it's a huge, huge scroll of it. You know, it's 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 humongous, very long. Um, wow. So, yeah. um, I can I can tell I narrowed it down um, the the choice of stitching to two, three um, uh, stitches in order to work towards my goal, which is to blur the lines and have a very distinct uh, graphic quality to it. Wow. They're just beautiful. Your stitch mark, I think, I mean, that was certainly something that we all fell in love with in our student group. We just, you know, your mark, your ability to... I guess it's not representational, it's abstraction. Can you talk me through that? Like, and, you know, because I think when you learn how to, to stitch, like like anything, like when you learn how to draw, you might, your, an instinct might be to go straight to try and make things look as realistic as possible and representational. But how did you take that from your sketches and your very detailed sketches in Florence into this beautiful stitched mark that's so abstract but just divine? I'm so glad you asked. So I'm going to be telling you a secret of Zara Muradian's practice. <laughs> oh, a secret. It's a secret. Okay. We're going yeah. to zoom in close for this one. Let's go. Yeah. So long <laughs> ago, uh, I was about 20 years old and I was going to my university studies and I had a professor, phenomenal, talented professor. Um, so he was insisting during the drawing classes, the graphic drawing classes, he would insist to do at least 100 to 300 sketches of the same exact object or uh, a person that was sitting in front of us. Um, when you're 20 years old, you don't, you don't want to do 100 or 300 of the same thing over and over and over. Okay. So ask uh why do you want us to why are you insisting on this so he told the the most genius thing that i i took it to a heart and just kept with me up until now and i'm applying it to my stitches as well so he told us um when you're doing first hundred sketches your brain is automatically generating the uh, the things that you've already seen after 102 sketches uh, the brain st stops the generating and get tired of it so you need to keep going until your your true identical marks will surface so wow some but yeah, some people, uh, it will take about 100 sketches to start doing their authentic marks. And for some, it took 300 to 350, but brain does that magic to you. So keep on doing samples and uh, just, just don't give up. So when it comes to stitches, Angela, um, you're doing that repetitive stitch over and over and over, and it's very easily achieved the, the 100 to 300 stitches then all of a sudden you start generating the new ways how to explore this stitch farther and uh yes it's 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 in so many ways it's abstract but um 
I think it's more exploratory. For me, it's always mm -hmm. exploration. What can I do with it? How far can I push? Where can I go with it? Yeah. So it's yeah. it's just that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. And I think you've stumbled across this secret formula, or maybe not so much secret anymore, but like this powerful formula of reduction so limiting yourself to say one subject one stitch and repetitiveness yes. so that and then that distills it doesn't it it's like you you you, you form your essence absolutely and mm. um by all means unfortunately i'm not a minimalist by mm. nature i love my fine details i like refining and having those small tiny details to catch the eye um but re reductive nature of of um, uh, art, I I love, I appreciate that, and I'm trying to be not that noisy by by taking away a lot of details. And when I do that, um, which was by the way, uh, Claire Ben's uh, phenomenal uh, tip to all of us. The the class was really helpful in that matter. I like going towards maximalism a lot of a lot of fine details but when you start reducing the noise that's when you see clearly that's when you don't need the extra words in order to be understood yeah mm -hmm. you know what i admire people that can say the most profound things in such you know minimal words isn't it powerful <laughs> and that silence is so powerful yes i think Thank you so much. I mean, I would take that compliment because I'm not I'm not English speaker, native English speaker. So if I can perform that skill, I'm very flattered. Yes, you certainly have, Zara, and your work. I'd love to share some of the pieces that we fell in love with during um, Out of This Earth. They're just absolutely divine. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about as another secret that you might have about not being too tight with your stitch. So you found your mark, you found it. Is there something that you do whilst you're stitching that helps you to be a little looser? Um, uh, that's, that's really part of the journey. So when you have health related issues and when you are arriving to, to fiber arts through the trauma, um, time and that tidiness is working a little bit different you really don't care <laughs> you do what pleases you so when yeah. you just let go your your inner voices and think would anyone like it w would anyone be responding to it and just what pleases you the most that is just the pure uh balance of things that's exactly how you get loose and of course the music helps it it always plays the good trick on your brain when you are yeah. not uh strictly focused on one particular task but you're listening and then um it's 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 interesting how music can elevate or just you get lost in it yeah, that's what I thought you were going to say, your music. You love to yeah. Yeah, listen to the music whilst you're stitching and then you get lost in it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. And classical uh, operas are my choices. And then there are a couple Armenian uh, musicians uh, who have written down some folk music, but um, just put it together and... Um, so beautifully so it it kind of reminds me of my um you know motherland of my childhood and my mountains and the the landscape that i grew up with yes um and the light is completely different so when i hear that music it always brings those broken down lines in my sketches or yeah. in stitches and um i'm always going Yes, bouncing back to to this this broken lines. <laughs> yeah, well, they're just beautiful. They certainly are your signature. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I want to share with people your backyard, and this was a place that you spent 
a long time looking through your window and this is what you see looking through your window and it inspired this beautiful healing inside you along with the the fiber art and the stitch and then you've created this amazing body of work because of it yep. Yep. So this is your beautiful and I feel very privileged to 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 show this image yeah because I feel like I'm sitting with you <laughs> yes. during that time <laughs> That is that is one of the most significant uh, part of my journey with um, with Claire Ben's classes because it was a desperate time for me. Um, you see, when when you have certain vocabulary of skills, yes, I knew how to stitch. Uh, yes, I knew how to draw, but there were certain times when I really couldn't do a whole lot. I would sit here in this exact same room right here and look out uh, to that window and uh, just notice and honor the privilege of being here, you know, just, just celebrating the being. And I would be noticing so many things that I would pass by in my regular times you know i would i would just sit and mesmerize look uh, outside to that uh, crackled concrete or uh, to the to the movement of the grass to falling leaf from the tree so it it was just tiny little things but at certain moment it was not small at all there was mm -hmm. nothing small whatsoever everything was huge <laughs> if that makes sense yeah. and i just uh, with with the series of landscapes um i've tried to um capture that that emotional time of my life when um when it was day to day different for me um it, it was tied up with my emotional insights and how did my response was my artistic response was to to that memories and thoughts and emotional state mm. how did the actual physical place of being outside come into the work um part of claire's course is you know creating textures and surfaces on the pigmented cloth can you talk us a little bit about your process to create these pieces and i'll click through them as we go so uh, first and foremost, um, to people who are going through the same things that I did, I know it's a it's whole bunch of people in, in, in our community. Um, so I found the earth pigment and soya milk <laughs> method, the less toxic, like no toxic ingredients whatsoever. So that was a big check mark for me. And then I, I saw the interview with Fiber Art Takes Two when Claire Ben was talking through her uh, process. And it's not uh, pre planned, it's always um, um, process led. And um, I just never thought of it as, a, as, a, as an artist. You're always sort of think about it. A little bit planning and then moving forward so mm. it was incredible for me to discover that idea of course i have to sign up i need to know the woman behind that thinking the the, the material so the discovery of it was incredible in sense of the the touch of the material the the actual connection to it and um if I used to take my canvas and start working on it immediately, I could take my canvas out of it, go outside, start working uh, on a surface and have that, that connection immediately. So it was very, very special. Mm. Let's say if I have some sort of a pre-planned landscape in my mind, I would certainly go out carry something into <laughs> into my studio with me and then start uh reproducing it right on the cloth with the earth pigments and it's all oh, the, the 
the colors, the textures, they were just right for me. You know, I, I fell in love with the material. I think I'm staying with it for, for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've got a lot to say with them. Like this one in particular is one of my favorites. It's, it's just beautiful. Um, I love the contrast that you're getting in, in, in your earth pigments in the background, but then also this subtlety of this beautiful abstracted stitch. And you're allowing the viewer, I guess, to make their own opinion and their own sense of what they're seeing. You're not forcing it upon someone. No, absolutely. I would, uh, I would certainly give a space and give enough information for the viewer to um, make their own uh, decisions or make up their own stories uh, within that space. Uh, it's it's very important for me to uh, be, you know, open ended. <laughs> yeah. In some ways. Yeah. So during, I mean, obviously, maybe during this time, it's a little bit different. But can you talk us through your creative process? So. Do you, you sit down and you and, and and you did mention it just now, but like I mean, when you were ill and healing, did that your creative process change as opposed to earlier on where you might basically want to create an outcome? Whereas here you kind of let the materials lead the way. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So um how did my art practice have changed? So if in um before uh, I would just sit down and go on with it. First sketches, then it will be choice of material, uh, then of course producing some work. Um, in this um, particular situation, I was just playing around and then I fell into this sort of daily practice mode where I just physically needed 30 minutes for myself to meditate with it. First, it will be the stitches, then the stitches will be um, applied to some other cloth uh, with the background. And usually I'm treating the, uh, the, the, the stitches as a lines. Mm. Like originally, I think those are the lines only three-dimensional they are popping out it's it's even better uh, than the than just regular sketchbook and uh, and uh, paint or things like that so i'm never going back to the old materials the the, the you know um classical materials um so i would go on with the stitching and then i will pick the earth pigments the color that intrigue the most, the, the nature of emotion that I'm feeling. Mm. Um, usually it applies with the colors. I know I'm, I'm strange like that. And right now it's uh, very monochromatic in order not to be loud, in order to be more quiet and reductive and just play with the nuances and uh, construct the, the quality and well-balanced composition so i will i will not not pre-plan but i would go out uh with my clothes and my earth pigments and we'll start uh exploring and playing around to see what kind of a texture is going to be coming next and uh, i would certainly go on with it um i have my my uh, studio um wall to put mm. it on, to think about it, and I probably will stare at the piece of cloth for days and days until it will just start talking to me. <laughs> yeah. I love that you said that, actually, because, I mean, Claire talks about having a dialogue with her work, and she speaks highly of, you know, you do the work, you put it on the wall, stare at it for weeks. Don't yeah. be in a rush to complete it. Like, let it tell you what it wants. And there's a beautiful actual article on our website, which actually, it's great. Claire's written it and it is about engaging with ancient ground. And she actually has a conversation with her 
work. So I recommend um, go and have a read of that. It's it's, it's a fabulous read. Um, but it is all about having that dialogue, like what does the work want? Tell me, where is yes. it leading me? Yes. And every single piece that I've created, so let's say I with the earth pigments, of course. So let's say I have this this view outside and um, I just think it's a good idea to go outside and explore it a little bit, what kind of a textures I would find there. So I would reprint the surface and come back and would stare at it. And um, it usually strikes me when the lighting is really correct. When I have a very strong light coming out, um, the earth pigment has this, this quality of playing on a sunshine. I'm not sure how to explain it. So you always see things. Uh, mm -hmm. through it you know it just shines correctly it just moves correctly and I always build up my composition around that vision of mine how do I feel when I see that yeah I love this particular piece here that you've allowed so much space on the right hand side and light and then you've carried it through and, and Claire speaks beautifully about this piece actually but you mentioned also earlier before that you were your you don't want your work to be loud and in your artist statement you say that you're a silent witness to the yes. work that you're producing can you talk us through a little bit about what it means to be a silent witness yes uh, so <clears throat> art in general for me is um, the 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 way that artist sees things so when you are loud and you are not spending enough time looking you would be dismissing so many small but beautiful details so when i'm uh, stating that i'm a silent witness um it's it's just for me being really um not not thinking of a nature as as a part of day to day but highlighting it and and uh, giving it the main stage to shine and looking at it uh, through my window as the main event as something that is happening and it's beyond my control and i don't want to change anything about it so uh, yes, the first, uh, the very first image that you showed. Um, yes, uh, so this would be the uh, the the uh, grass from my from my uh, backyard, and I imprinted it, and then I left the the other side um, sort of empty to to show the viewer. This is my window view and i'm inviting you to to participate in this activity to see how the, the grass is really not that tall however it's it's a huge huge event when you see how it moves um, against the wind uh, right. so uh, yeah that's why it has a, such a emotional background because i meant it and it was just very deep from my heart um, and the connection was uh, instant. Yeah, it's a very powerful piece. It's beautiful. And look, just look at those details and that beautiful stitch. Incredible. Yeah, yeah that's my that's my couching and back stitch. Uh, so you just take the back stitch and have fun with it. That's that's one of the results. <laughs> I love that. Take the back stitch and have fun with it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> For, for others, that will sound really, really crazy. But for the stitchers and fiber art community, they will get it. Like, I, I love applying my um, couching. And I would be like, um, what is the exciting texture I can get from it? Or let's just have fun today with a fly stitch. Or I don't know. And my daughter will look at me. Um, Mom, is everything okay? I'm like, yes, I'm just I'm just having conversation with the stitches. Don't find me. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. I didn't know that you had a daughter. That's gorgeous. 
this. Mm. I have never 10 years old. <laughs> wow. Girl. She must be so proud and in awe of what you're doing, what you're creating. Yeah, she she got she got inspiration and uh, she asked me to complete one of one of the works of mine which I um which I completed, but I thought it's a non-successful one from Claire Ben's uh, workshop. So it was just tossed on the side. Uh, it win. <laughs> somewhere, yes. In a, in a, a, we don't throw, we don't burn anything in this household. We always <laughs> repurpose and reuse. I would always use it for the applique pieces or something. It's 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 funny how things work. Um, so. She saw that piece and she said, can you make this as a, uh, the figures that you do with the mm. stitches? Uh, I want to have it in my room. So I'm inspired by that. And I absolutely share that um, with, uh, with you later on. Um, the, yeah. the work is half completed. It's in a process. So i would love to for, for 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 you to see that yeah i'd love to see it yeah that'd be beautiful yeah. you mentioned about the stitch community and i want to touch on that because how important was i mean i know how important it is for me but for you how important was finding you know your tribe finding community to help you through you know, yeah. the darkest times it's uh it's incredible how things are working out sometimes uh so when uh, when i started my journey in fiber art right um i didn't i didn't think that it's going to be leading me somewhere i thought it's just a um sideway uh, in order to gain some some you know confidence and skills back and then i will bounce back to my classical training which which always been my goal and then I found out this group of ladies who are, uh, it's, it's a small group, but um, everyone is just very passionate about it, uh, very passionate. And some of us are, were novices in, in uh, textile arts, in, in, um, in stitching. So the journey start for all of us in sort of, from zero up until now, we are all building it up to the point that uh, one just had a solo exhibition. I'm doing the interview with you. And uh, another one is taking the art classes inspired by all those talks. And it's it's just uh, very inspiring Zoom meetings once, uh, once a month. Um, and it can take uh, around two to three hours for us to just discuss everything speech related textile fibers or just art related <laughs> that is so great i just love to hear that and yeah i think it's it's so important as well i'm so glad you found your your people mm. yeah some some of them i i talk uh, on a daily basis already and we are all around the world. One we have in, in uh, Great Britain, another is uh, down in um, uh, Carolinas, and then uh, Canada and Denmark. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Yeah, Denmark's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so pleased. Yeah, I'm so pleased, Zara. That is gorgeous. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very encouraging. So whatever you do, uh, just finding your... Uh, right people would be the right way to go. Um, one uh, a long time ago, one of my mm, see that the, be the beauty of university is that you have all these outlets uh, to to learn philosophy, theory, uh, the psycho mm. psychology and craft. So one time uh, my, my uh, philosophy teacher told me, uh, if you are in a room, and you are the smartest in the room you are in a wrong room <laughs> yeah, i love that saying i love that saying <laughs> yeah it's 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 a wonderful thing and i'm like okay so i found my people and i'm very comfortable with them i know they're going to be watching this interview and going to be rooting for me so <laughs> yeah. yeah well i wish that we were live and we would have put their names up and said hi but Let's say hi now. Thanks for watching. <laughs>
That is yeah. so great. Yeah. Tell me, Zara, who are some of your heroes? Um, we've mentioned artists, well, in in when we were preparing for this interview, we were mentioning mentioning Maggie Hamblin and Barnett Newman. Tell me a little bit about about them and, and why they're, they're heroes to you. Yes. Um, so clearly Maggie Hamblin is, she's a force. Um, she's so authentic. She's so strong when it comes to opinions and she would never shy away to express them. And it always shows in her work. Um, a series of um, sketches that she, she shared. And unfortunately, I haven't been lucky enough to see it in person, but I've seen her interview um, that the sketch se series called The Touch. Yeah. It was fantastic. And then when I saw, start discovering her work a little bit more, um, I didn't respond quite as much to her uh, sculptures but her uh, series of ocean, it was just magnificent. And I'm a mountain person. I'm a Highlander by heart. <laughs> but but those the, the ocean, it was more than just a landscape. And it was explosion of the emotions. You can see the artist was living through something when mm -hmm. she was drawing it. <laughs> yeah, incredible. And for Barnett Newman, um, that's that's really that's really simple. Um, back in 2018, when I discovered the slow uh, slow art movement for myself, I went to again. Uh, it was one day. It was uh, August Rodin for me. I was just moved by that that force, the movement, the half done sculpture. But yet again, it makes sense to you. Then I move the next time to to Degas' little um, uh, clay sculptures of of studies, human body, women body studies. So um, I've done quite a lot of sketches over there. Moved on to Leonardo, spent about four hours just looking at it in person. Unfortunately, I I kind of like I was not a nice visitor was just pushing everyone to just take my time and um there should be yeah. more visitors like you there should be more visitors like you and less visitors trying to take selfies with the mona lisa i'm telling you <laughs> yeah, no, no, i was trying to analyze that that yeah. that uh, the, the genius yeah uh, and then i the next time i went to uh, went to ray Brand and uh, i analyzed all his works how he was working not on a plain background he, he, yeah no one ever from the classical trained artists from the liberal arts right um no one starts from the white canvas so having said that um just the encouragement for for everyone who is intimidated by that white color um just start from the background and then build your um confidence upon like layers and layers uh, uh, apply the, the apply the background first so and then i went up to the um, to the modernist gallery so it was the gallery uh, the hall for um, newman yeah um so i said there angela i'm not gonna lie i sat there for about two hours just yeah. sinking in what I just saw. <laughs> Imagine having that experience of that that very intricate and detailed art throughout the month, and then all of a sudden coming 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 up to to seeing the Barnett Newman. Yeah, mm, I was just shocked how little you need. Yes, to be so. Uh, I don't know how to say like it was eliminating for me um yeah. the skill the amount of skill that that man had uh if you will see it's just a uh, off white canvas with uh two or three stripes right but the tonal nuances in every single stripe is so different and just gives you a space to imagine things so 
without having any, any knowledge about him previously, I start imagining myself being in this landscape and seeing this old trees, how, how it just, it just took me somewhere else. So yeah. I like the idea of minimalism and I'm striking towards it, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> I think it's always, I think it's all, people are always striving towards it. I think because our tendency is to want to put more and more and more and more. And I know Claire talks about it as well because she's a very reductive artist, but she struggles with that. She, she, sometimes she goes, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to put more into this. I don't need to. So yeah. yeah, I think it's just something, it's just a path you'll always be on. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and uh, it does take um, in so many ways that the courage mm. to be so reductive because you think that um, I have always this, you know, when you are, when you are a very artistic person, you always chase this thought or yeah. this is the memory and you chase that memory and you think, how do I relate to that? So I was chasing that thought of um, what is it that art should be? Um, does it supposed to be please us or we need to be provoking any ideas or thoughts mm -hmm. and um i felt like it does need to be provoking uh, rather than pleasing because when you start to become a pleaser of the crowd um you lose the out basically it's like this is it you know i'm not the housework can wait i'm going to sit and stare out my window and the, the small things become very very profound and, and big yeah so how can an artist you know, we don't obviously want to wish that upon people, but I mean, what what advice would you give people who, who want to be more honest with themselves, to be more true, to be more authentic in their work? What, what would you tell them? Um, I would I would tell don't fall into trends and think really carefully. Take a long, long time thinking. What is it that I wanted to talk about? Uh, what is it that I want to express? It should have some sort of a message to it. And what is the message that I want to be remembered uh, for? So uh, think carefully, think really long and work really hard in a matter of skill building. And then the idea and the skill will apply, apply uh, really quickly when you have a clear path in front of you. Uh, I knew I wanted to be um, emotional uh, on my canvases. I really wanted to see that motion, that movement, that that um, that mystery, um, sort of um, enigmatic feel to my space. So think think about where is it that you want to be right now and what is the space that you're suggesting your viewer and don't be a pleaser <laughs> oh that's such great advice don't be a pleaser yeah yeah, yeah. do it for you like um most of the time we uh we do have the tendency to feel guilty about not delivering enough especially especially women unfortunately we have mm. so much on our shoulders and um i have to tell that um we shouldn't be perfect all the time life is messy and we can be messy too the stitches should be messy if you feel that way and the paint should be that way if you feel that way so really thinking carefully what is it that you want to be expressing right now it's the part of the process. Just explore it. <laughs> oh, Zara, thank you. That is so beautiful. Before we finish, um, I wanted just to touch on, you know, you emphasise not providing solutions but rather illuminating thoughts and feelings in your work. So how do you see your role as an artist in storytelling and especially now you're exploring themes about conflict and immigration and displacement of people so 
these modern conflicts, like in human stories, how are you portraying them without, I guess, providing solutions to it? I mean, that's, that's, you don't see that as your role as an artist and, and that's fantastic. Can you elaborate a little bit on these themes and, and how your work speaks to that? Yes. Yeah, so um, what is important for me is to inform in so many ways of what is going on besides our world. You know, when, when you have a problem, unfortunately, I have to say that when you have a very big problem, um, world sort of spins around you and you do don't see anything except for your pain, for your grief, or for your own trauma. But think about it as an opportunity to um, be more exploratory. And um, when it comes to relating to, to the, to the uh, modern warfares, I think by depicting those small wanderers in, in, uh, in my uh, canvases, I sort of uh, start the dialogue of being lost. And those are the small stories of individuals who were caught in the middle of the conflict and they were so, their stories have been very neglected. And in so many ways, I do feel their pain. I do share that lost connection with their own homeland and uh, the forcement, the displacement and, uh, and that grief that you might never go back. It does resonate with me as a uh, immigrant. However, I'm not even comparing myself because I've had a luxury of choice. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, I just want to enlighten public, and I'm I'm not I'm not trying to suggest anything. I'm not trying to seek any solutions in this. I'm just trying to enlighten the public of seeing those individuals of seeing me or seeing that that particular refugee who has some stories to tell yeah well you've certainly illuminated thoughts and feelings within all of us today I'm sure everybody watching uh now and on the replay they're going to be just um totally inspired Zara by your journey by your work by all the wonderful insights and tips you've given people tonight. I was not expecting that. Wow. <laughs> uh, if it's if it's any way helpful, even if it's um, this interview might uh, ignite an idea or inspiration or help even one individual who's struggling, um, I would be so happy. Just wow. as my community have helped me, just as my group of uh, ladies, teaching ladies, uh, helped me. I hope this will ignite the ideas and uh, inspiration for them. Wonderful. You're such yeah. a generous person. Thank you. So giving and honest and, and authentic, Zara. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angela. This was amazing, amazing interview. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. It was really a pleasure talking. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm going to play the exit slideshow now and I want to thank everybody for watching. Thanks for leaving a comment for Zara and thank you very much for sharing your gratitude. Zara, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to follow your journey and I want to see your work in a beautiful exhibition one day soon. <laughs> thank you so much. Absolutely. Hoping so. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. See you for now. Bye. Okay. See you for now. Bye.